Hello, everybody, and welcome to another one of these Facebook live streams with Light and Land. Myself, Sam Gregory, and the cup of tea, otherwise known as Verity <laughs> Milligan. <laughs> Classic presenter throw to someone who's sipping their tea. How are you doing, Verity? <laughs> I'm all right. I'm good. Um, good. I'm, I'm, yeah, it's, it's been a long day, but it's been a good day. Oh, I've just had a long day. No good day, just a long day. But it's all good. We're, we're happy to be, be here. good now. <laughs> exactly. Business has picked up. Verity's in the building. Uh, we are here to talk to you about the Isle of Lewis. And there's even a conversation to be had about that. Uh, but we're going to get into some of Verity's images ahead of a tour that she's leading there in February, all things being equal, we all know the plates are spinning on that one. Uh, but uh, if you're joining us, you know the drill. Uh, welcome back. Uh, do let us know where you're joining from. Drop that in the comments. I can see a couple of you coming in already. We've got Jez from Dorchester, Lynn up there in Scotland, and she has a wee glass of Harris to hand. Uh, so Verity, was there anything Harris related in your tea there? <laughs> I mean, it's definitely tea, that's for sure. Yeah, it's not like some sort of, um, it's definitely in a cup of wine. Okay, oh, that's a shame. We will be doing a late night <laughs> cup of wine live stream. But things could go if off feast. I finished my Harris gin, I think, a couple of nights ago. So, yeah, I'm all out of, um, I'm all out of Hebridean um, spirits Plonk. right now. Yeah, but I am, I am waiting for their whiskey. We're, we're signed up for the first, the Herach. We're signed up for the first bottle of whiskey when it finally is deemed to be ready. Um, oh, I'm not wow. sure we're allowed to open it. I think it's just going to sit on the shelf. And, uh, um, it's one of those yeah, they just got to buy it and keep it. Yeah, I think so. Uh, although, mm. yeah, my wife is a massive whiskey fan, so that's, you have to hide it, I think. Put it in a glass case or something. <laughs> so buy it, hide it, hopefully keep it. Um, everyone yeah. coming in, thank you. We've got Chesterfield, we've got Milan, fantastic. Bournemouth, uh, County Down, Liverpool. Oh, crikey. Stuart and Gail from the Isle of Lewis. No pressure there, Verity. Uh, no, that. <laughs> Surrey, Cape Town, Ilfracoon, Tunbridge Wells. I'm basically just listing places. You're all here, so I'm going to get moving. Um, I have had a troublesome day, so I, I do not know what I'm doing tonight, so bear with me, everyone. But we've got Calgary, Northumberland. Again, I'm listing more places. But Verity, just before we get into it, a uh, little plug for what's coming up. Next week is myself and Adrian are doing another one of our creative choices where we're going to ask for your raw files. And I'll, I'll give you more information about that at the end of this evening. And Adrian and I will take them off in different editing directions and talk about the hows and the whys of that. So that's next Tuesday, 8 p.m. We've got a load of stuff packed up till Christmas. We're going to be on every night, pretty much every Tuesday night anyway. So uh, stay tuned. However, there we go. That's enough preamble, Sam. Uh, let's get into tonight. Obviously, we're joined by Verity again, and we, we did Wales last time. We're going a bit further north, so even colder and even wetter. Is it possible, Verity? Tell us it is or it isn't. Or to be even colder and even wetter. Than Wales. <laughs> than Wales. I'm not sure. <laughs> it really depends. I mean, the Wales didn't, it, like, that got, that got postponed. Feels like, obviously, 2020 is out to get me. Um, I, I mean, I would have enjoyed the cold and the wet version of, of Wales. Um, um, I had hoped to go up to the Isle of Lewis as well over the end of September um, and the beginning of October to get a broader range of images to go and check out some of the beaches that I'd been to, but not really taken any photos that I liked of before. Um, I've really sort of hoped to spend the entire week on the island, really properly making friends of it. And then <laughs> just no, Nicola Sturgeon said no. She said, forget it. You're not coming up here. You're not. Stay down there. Stay down there in England for now. Thank you very much. And of course, you know, the islands are precious and they don't have the same kind of services that the mainland does. And it'd been one of those um, ethical dilemmas, I guess, about whether we went up at all. And obviously at the beginning of lockdown, it, we booked it, I think we booked it in January. So it was just sitting there as a, something on the horizon, thinking, is this, is this going to happen? And when everything kind of calmed down over the summer, I was like, okay, yeah, it's, you know, I think we might be all right, but 
of course, um, as as with everything this year, you you expect the unexpected. So unfortunately, I don't have a brand new suite of images to show you. Um, sort of dug back through the archive. I've been on the islands four or five times. I got married on Harris last year. Um, my head was like, was that last year? It feels like about seven years ago now. Um, so I have a real affinity with the place. And with with Lewis in particular, I feel like it gets it gets overlooked as, a, as an island. I mean, the two, uh, uh, geographically wide, they're, they're just one big island, but separated into two by a, a land border. And from from the top of Lewis down to the bottom of Paris, they are very different in terms of their topography and you know there's not many trees um the further south you get it's a bit more of a of a moonscape and it's a bit more lush and greener further towards towards the top so yeah i think when i was sort of putting this together there's like i've run quite a few tours to the whole of the Isle of hebrides and the isle of harris and i just wanted to do one that was specifically lewis and and yeah and sort of introduce people to to, to that part of the island as well Cool. Well, that's my ramble. <laughs> yeah, no, no, that was good. That was good. Uh, and um, it's quite good for us to just think about uh, some of that as we look at some of the topography here. And, and like Verity said, it does vary throughout the island. And also, some of you may have seen a lot of images. You know, it's one of those um, places and up and around the islands generally where we do see a lot of landscape photography. And perhaps actually, before, let's just bring the first image up, Verity, but you know what just generally and i know they vary up there but why is it do you think that us landscape photographers seek out some of these sorts of places especially in in the more wilder weather there, there is a there's a ruggedness to it there's an isolation to it that um a sort of unspoken uh idea that this this hasn't changed in millennia that i think photographers especially landscape photographers get drawn to um and because it's and Ireland as well, the weather is so unpredictable, it, it moves through. And there's a real, just, just a sense of place that, that keeps pulling you back. And when you live in a city like I do, any opportunity to get out somewhere that, that, that does feel remote, that does feel um, epic in the sort of truest sense of the word, I think we photographers are drawn to that. I don't know if it's just because we're <laughs> a bunch of antisocial people, but get, let's get away from people. I mean, the island itself, the people on the islands are just amazing humans. So, so welcoming. So, I mean, I'm not that antisocial <laughs> to enjoy sort of their, their, their kind of company. But yeah, there's something primordial about it. And it's different. It's different from the, the inner Hebrides. It's different from Sky and it's different from Den Africa or the places that you might explore in Scotland on your way up to it and it takes a long time to get to so it really it feels like a worthwhile journey when you get to the end of that um when um when I when we were planning me and Rachel planning our wedding last year the year before when we were planning it we sort of thought that no one would really want to come up to the island we sort of thought we'd get away with just like maybe you know eight to ten people and a really small wedding but literally everyone we were invited was like okay this sounds like an adventure and I think that that sense of adventure really shines through on places like the Outer Hebrides. So from a photographic point of view in terms of a location for doing a workshop that's that's really good isn't it because the the guest who comes can clock off normal location time normal life to, to some degree and um, really get involved in in imbibing the atmosphere of the place and imbibing the atmosphere and, and getting into photography, I, I suppose, in, you know, with 100% concentration. And, you know, you mentioned there that the, the wildness of it, and we sort of, a lot of us seek that in our imagery. In this particular location, uh, Verity, can you just kind of explain a little bit of the background here? We've got a couple of shots from this location. So maybe a bit about the background and then this particular day and this particular image, perhaps. Yeah, I think this, this sort of series of images is designed to show that it's not just about beaches as well, that there's a diversity in the landscape, that you might think of the Outer Hebrides as a place where, you know, fantastic beaches, the turquoise seas, and yes, that's absolutely part of it, and I love that about it. But there's a, there's a real um, 
diversity in different types of landscapes that you can explore and I think from the perspective of anybody going on a workshop that kind of diverse, diversity really it's exciting it's you know you're not just taking the picture of pictures of the sort of same environment every day there's something different to be had and this is um <laughs> If you can imagine, it's really hard to, it's a really long road. This is in um, Ashmore, and I'll probably pronounce names wrong, and I'm very sorry to people who live on Lewis who might be, uh, just be like, you know, ah, I knew I was gonna not close my, my mail down. One second, let's not have that interrupting. Um, yeah, so there's, if you sort of, put, in your mind, there's a bunch of sort of residential housing behind me um, and holiday homes and stuff. So there's, and it was one of those, those mornings where I was driving speculatively um, which isn't, you know, sometimes, sometimes you go out with a defined point in your mind about what you want to go and photograph. And sometimes you just kind of get in the car or you get out on foot and you walk and you see what happens. And this was one of those mornings and it was quite, um, quite wet. There was, there was some showers coming through and we were staying near Boston beach. Um, so we'd sort of driven down and I think the intention was that we drive all the way down to Harris throughout the, the island and see, go from Lewis to Harris and see what we could find. And when we sort of saw this scene, so this is from Lewis looking towards the Harris Hills and they've got all of these sort of um, locks, the little locks that are really good for, for bringing up a little bit of mist and a little bit of atmosphere. And the mist was just rising up and there's a tiny, there was a tiny bit of snow left on um, the hilltops in the background um, and I think all three of the images I've got in this little set are all taken with a telephoto lens because what I really just wanted to do was kind of hone in on those vignettes that you can find in the landscape and just bring out some of that atmosphere of the mist coming off the landscape um, and then some of the the early morning sun hitting it and defining out so obviously it's quite a it's quite a brown, it's quite moonscapey in a way. So um, having that little bit of light just helps to differentiate between some of the different tonality throughout the image. And this was, this is spring just before, so you're sort of looking early April. Um, so still getting snow, still getting a bit of um, interesting winter type weather, um, which, which is always from a landscape photography point of view, you always want something that's a little bit interesting. Yeah, yeah, and I think um, color, color wise, that's a good point, isn't it? There's there's these warm, these warm tones which which contrast with the, the sky. Obviously, it's cooler, and and having that mist helps with the layering. I suppose layering is something a lot of people like to play with in mountain ranges, but the conditions can either help or hinder that, right? Yeah, and I suppose it's it's a different approach than what I'd take if I was at the coast i wouldn't necessarily use a telephoto lens for some of the stuff that i would take pictures of along the coastline of lewis but stuff like this it just sort of demands you compressing that depth of field so you can really get into the heart of the image or else the sky there was some pinks above it but there was there was also clear sky if i remember rightly so the wider shots it, it just gets lost which i think i don't want to i don't want to go too much into starting talking about composition and stuff it's not it's not that kind of <laughs> not necessarily that kind of um talk but I think yeah it just I think having the opportunity to explore different ways of using your camera and different ways of seeing I think is is exciting and and um from my, if I was on a workshop or if I'm you know just on holiday um I tend to take you know a couple of different selections of lenses with me so I think from from my perspective it just gives me something different to explore and you know push myself creatively yeah and i love these little touches of light which just help define uh, some of these transition points and that's that gives that feeling of depth um that that we obviously all enjoy when we're sort of viewing those epic vistas so to speak um just a quick one for everyone who's watching along thank you for uh, a few more of let us know where you're coming in from uh, as ever we're happy to take any questions throughout the course of the evening so if you do have anything you'd like to know about lewis about verity about photography uh that's pretty much the topics we can cover um then do just drop us a little comment and I, i'll be moderating and picking those up as we go and one other thing that will really help us if you can uh, just drop 
or punch that like button for us if you're watching along and you like what we're doing. That really is helpful uh, for Facebook to see what we're doing and where we're going. V, I'm just going to take us on to the next image from this little set, if that's okay. And well, okay, so this is. We'll just let her get it sorted there. Failing me, you're like in and out. There we go. Back on these now. She's back. She's back. Okay. Okay. Good you're you're there. I'm there. It's all good. So this is an this is not a million miles from there, is it? And we've got some of the similar sort of conditions, but different image here. And this this cool reflection here at the bottom is what I quite enjoy about this. It's kind of a slightly um, it, well, it demands your attention momentarily. Let's just say that. But if you can explain to us where we are here and, and a little bit more behind this image so this is a little bit earlier as you can tell by the fact that it's devoid of some of that early light and i actually really enjoy shooting it's not necessarily the blue hour we've kind of gone past the blue hour slightly at this point but when when you've got those kind of cooler tones coming through um i think that can that can really contrast with some of the warmer tones going on in the landscape. And you're right, I really, really tried to compose. And it was quite difficult because it looked a little bit like a void, the, the, the lock, the, the water, the reflection at the bottom. And so I tried really hard to, to compose it. So it added something rather than took something away from it because it's not necessarily reflecting back what's in the image because I'm quite high up. So in a way, I'm sort of standing quite high up and shooting down onto the scene so there's no way i can get those reflections that maybe if i was at a shoreline i'd be able to get low down and i'd be able to to capture um so yeah it's about trying to find something within the composition that just adds to those different layers that's reflected back not reflected back not necessarily um a direct version of the image that we're seeing but some of the elements that already exist within the image sort of the mist in the in the background and the the lock that exists beyond and then those cool tones on the the hills and in, in the further background when we're looking towards it's got a bit more snow on the top there as well kind of mimicking the cool gray blue tones of the water itself yeah i think that that reflection and someone's actually mentioned that in the comments the, the, the reflection in the foreground really makes the image work is what john was saying and i i absolutely agree i think it's it sort of makes everything else sort of hover and levitate <laughs> which is which well which is slightly um, beguiling and isn't wholly what we would expect visually to see when we have that lightness in the foreground and, and i like that because it just makes me think about it a little bit more i think most people and that's why you're not most people verity would probably <laughs> have have just lost that um and, and sort of compose from this from this end up and i think that would have been a real loss because it's definitely it's definitely adding something especially because we've like you say we've got this this coolness here in the in the water so these these locations are fairly accessible uh mm -hmm. presumably and and when you you're presumably seeing a pretty wide vista here so there's quite a lot to go at especially if you've got a telephoto yeah absolutely there was loads there was loads to capture and I get it was just about trying to find the scene that worked and you're right you know that there is probably an image in there where you could crop it out and that would work out. and it's funny what what speaks to one person I think which is either endlessly fascinates me about photography anyway what what speaks to one person perhaps another person doesn't necessarily see the same vision and um I think what what I really like about this particular landscape as well is that it almost doesn't feel of this earth. It's very different from what you might see in the kind of pastoral locations of the Lake District. And there's really no green at all. Um, it's, 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 yeah, for me, it, it's otherworldly. And I think that that kind of early morning tones and the kind of almost surreal first bar of it add to that otherworldly quality, which which is probably why I decided after that, after that, I think I took hundreds of images that morning. And this is one of the ones that I decided to actually edit. I go back to the, 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 the suite of images I took that morning and um, quite regularly and just have a look at them and think, is there something else that I might be able to get out of these? And should I have a play around? And 
and I think mornings like that are really special. I mean, mornings like that just really, they, they, they add value to being a photographer. They kind of keep you getting up early and they keep you really chasing those kind of interesting compositions and conditions. Yeah, definitely. And uh, I, I think you're right about the otherworldly. Ralph has said it looks almost volcanic. And I think that's a really good explanation too. Uh, a good interpretation, sorry. It does look... Um, yeah, it could be Iceland. It could be, a, I mean, it doesn't really matter where it is, does it? And it does and it doesn't always. But I think that is so different to what we might see in other parts of, of the UK. And that's probably why it's interesting for you as well. Uh, quick questions come in from Barbara. Uh, I've visited Lewis and Harris three times and always had rain and more rain. <laughs> Sorry, Barbara. Uh, which time of year would you recommend for a visit with a camera? And I think I know where this answer might be going, but Verity, tell us. <laughs> <laughs> February 8th to 12th. <laughs> um, you know, it's one of these places that I, that, other than the summer, where it's a midge fest, because all of Scotland is a midge fest. Um, I visited in winter, I visited in spring. I was meant to visit in autumn, but obviously, as I've described, that, that, that plan's on, on, on ice for the time being. I, you know what? I love it in the rain. And I don't know if that just means that. I've just sort of been worn into landscape photography where I've just given up and gone, right, any condition is a good condition. But there's something about this place in particular where I don't want it to be sunny because if you're, especially if you're sort of taking pictures by the coast, it really changes the color of the sea. And it's still, it's still endearing. It's still photogenic, but there's a, if it's moody and there's cloud and it just, it just brings out these wonderful blues from the sea that I find when, when the sun's out and it's quite strong, it takes away some of that um, glorious turquoise-ness that I'm always sort of looking for. I've predominantly visited in spring and actually I really like it in spring because it's, it's, I'm a fan of transitional months anyway, but you've got the end of winter and the beginning of spring and where those two collide is when you get all kinds of interesting conditions. So I've I've been on the islands when it snowed overnight and the snow, it doesn't really snow down at ground level very often, but it snowed overnight. So it's just sitting on some of the hills and by 9 a.m. it's gone. And that changeability, I think really, um, I think it, it, it's, yeah, it's, it's great from a photography point of view. But yeah, I think whatever time you go, you, you need to take your, your rain your rainproof coats, yeah. your wellies, your galoshes. <laughs> galoshes, yeah. Um, yeah, and I think you do get often on the back end or the front end of weather like that, you, you do get some stunning light. And that's that's the teaser because that's what a lot of us go looking for. I've put a little poll up just actually out of interest. And forgive me, I've been slack on my polls recently, getting back into it. I shouldn't give time off, should they? They shouldn't let me out. Um, do you enjoy shooting in the rain slash bad weather? Yes or no? That's the question. Uh, and cut, boom, blimey, talking of conditions changing probably on the back or front end of some weather, it's as if I knew what was coming next, Verity. Um, <laughs> don't give me that much credit. What the heck is happening here? This is this is a Verity because it's 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 colourful. It's 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 got of, a rainbow. <laughs> it's got a rainbow. It's lively. It's some of those warmth, uh, you know, warm tones that you talk about and cool tones behind, but. This looks like it is an absolutely magical moment. Tell me more. Yeah, I think this is one of those images and one of those moments that stuck with me. And um, it was one of the first images I ended up having printed in a magazine. I think it was an outdoor photographer and it was a real proud moment for me. Um, still is. And yeah, it had, you, get, you get light like this sometimes. You get moments like this sometimes that they cause you to, <laughs> to sort of almost lose your mind slightly. So um, I was sort of, I had, I think I had two cameras on me and I was running up and down a road, just taking it all in, trying to capture it, wide angle, telephoto. And it was one of those um, moments where the conditions were beyond me. So I didn't get rained on for once. So the, the, it was sunrise and a shower went over and it went over the other side of where I was standing. So the sun was behind me projecting on, onto the, the, the shower, the rain shower that was going over and it just created this rainbow that stuck around for ages. Um, 
and that's another thing about the art. I find if you get a rainbow on on Lewis, it sticks around and Harrison. In fact, it just it must be the way that it works on the art, the way the weather moves through. But yeah, I can relate this to you if I see a I see a rainbow. By the time I've got my camera ready, it's 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 disappeared off again. So when it gives you a bit more opportunity to kind of capture. And um, you can see that the, what I really liked was the fact that it was this rainbow was almost bookended by the the cloud at the top, the the sunrise light coming through, some of that colour, and then the the mist rising off the lock at the bottom. Um, and I just liked the way it sort of sandwiched it between it. And I mean, I know that me and you have spoken about this before, Sam, but the, where where and I'm not saying. It's for someone else to judge whether a photographer or photo photograph is good or not, but it's where sort of composition and conditions meet. It's that that pinnacle where you've got the conditions that are on your side, you've got something that no one else is seeing. You're the only sort of um, photographer on this this stretch of road, and that responsibility on you to capture it and um and to do it well and not just not just capture the conditions not just capture the rainbow but find a way of slotting all of those elements together and i guess for me there's a couple of things about this where i've got many other shots <laughs> you could imagine of the same scene but this one in particular worked and i think it's because of where the rainbow is which is balanced out by just a little bit of the the, the lock on the other side like i said sandwiched between the cloud and, and the mist at the bottom and there's, if you can see them it might be a bit blurry on the on the feed but there's just four little sheep just the other side of that rainbow um <laughs> and it's just something about those elements that just sit together well that yeah that it gives it a sense of scale because the rainbow is arching up it's arching way above those hills into the sky and there's a real yeah a sense of scale to the image and i think I'm not accustomed to liking my own photos, but this is one that I'll let pass. I'll let it pass. It's yeah, a lot of us have an extremely high um, self filter on liking photos. And if we do like it, it's pretty temporary. I think that's what I tend to experience when I'm talking to people. And I think Verity, you've, you've touched on a couple of it. And as I'm sort of looking at this, it's, it's, I'm just letting it seep in. It's so, you know, it's just, I just know how you will have felt. It's, it's, quite a rom it's quite a romantic image because of the, the tones within it and you touched on the composition which you very modestly kind of explained but I think you're absolutely right with the position of the rainbow the position of the lock that we have the sense of scale because our, our, our land is quite low um, and so we're allowing all this space above it which which gives the you know the feeling of grandeur but like you said this glorious bit of mist down here at the bottom just diffusing uh, our, our eye from from bumping into that bottom of the frame Every, everything about it is cracking and I think you touched on it when you're in these situations you know how do you do you just shoot a lot I mean obviously you're thinking but how do you make sure that you do try and get that winning combo of you've got to be quick and sometimes we like to work slowly don't we, we might be exploring a, a little detail on a beach and you can really take your time but this sort of thing I know you mentioned the rainbows last longer there potentially but you know what I'm saying you know it's going to be you've got to be quick conditions are changing um, how do you make sure you still keep your eyes really peeled to the composition and and, and capture it in the best possible way as you outlined and I, you know this I think it's practice I think the more you do something, the more you spend time out there in the landscape, understanding how stuff fits together, the, the, the easier it gets, essentially, the more inherent it gets, the more it becomes an intuition rather than a thought process. Now, I don't know that I necessarily at the time consciously compose this and that sounds a bit strange but the more you're sort of looking through that viewfinder the more you you start to just know how things work together and yeah people can be born with a with the eye they can see stuff some people will, will take to landscape photography and have a real sense of composition before they've even really begun um and some people like me <laughs> spend a whole decade just 
enjoying it so much that you go back out there again and again and again and you make your mistakes and you take those mistakes and you use them to make yourself better later down the line and I think earlier in my photographic journey perhaps I would have done a bit of a um, shoot and spray kind of approach of take hundreds of photos and hope that one fits together well um, I think the more I've got into this the less I do that the more I start to it, the thing is with stuff like this when you've got a rainbow and you've got a sunrise and you've got mist you've got this sort of holy trinity of conditions going on it's very hard to sort of stay in the moment um oh sorry <laughs> preview yeah teaser um <laughs> so yeah and, and i think as 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 i've done more and more of it i've kind of i've kind of worked out more or less that i don't need to shoot the same thing a hundred times i can think about it a bit more and take a deep breath and kind of get into the image but you know it's a trajectory isn't it we're all on that trajectory together some of us are, might be mildly further along but it's all it's all a bit, it's all about just you know looking at the scene working it out enjoying it at the same time i think this is the hard thing as well like yes it's fabulous that i've got an image of this but good grief it was epic to see it was just mind-blowing to watch this this weather move over me and and to know that you know other very few people were, were seeing this so yeah, it's a privilege to capture it, but it's also a privilege to witness it. Yeah, um, excellent point. Really, really important to do that and not be full of anxiety about making sure you're, you're quote unquote, catching it. You know, you, you are there primarily as a human to enjoy it. And so that's a really good, um, good point. Even if you're on a workshop and you've paid to go there, <laughs> uh, you'll remember the time you spent looking at it as much as you will enjoy the photo in my experience. Mm. Um, yes. Now I gave us a little preview there because of my clumsy fingers. So I should, <laughs> I should, I should bring us on and Verity. Uh, thank you, by the way. Um, I've been really luxuriating into these images and I, I probably should be mildly conscious of the time. Um, but this particular rainbow there's a little bit of a story here. I'll let you explain. Yeah, so this isn't my image. This is an image of uh, one of my, my favorite humans in the entire world um, called Rich Jones, who is also an incredibly talented photographer and whom I go, we've been going away with him for, for many, many years. Um, and <laughs> I don't have a picture of the Kalanish stones that I like because I'm a, pain in the butt perfectionist who refuses to share images that that are below any kind of sort of standard there so um i sort of asked him if he'd be kind enough to lend me one of his images for this because i think you can't really talk about lewis without talking about these ancient standing stones that are such a wonderful compositional i mean they're a composition i mean they're, they're far more than a compositional device don't get me wrong but yeah i think um it, it's just a place that you that you have to go and feel the weight of history in a way now this is the same rainbow this is the same rainbow as the last image um but we went different ways that morning <laughs> so um i'm not sure who regrets it more me or him um he got the rainbow over the stones i got the rainbow over the the sort of harris hills looking back from from Ackmore. um but i think it, it it makes me happy that both of us were somewhere on the island that morning witnessing this the sort of same conditions going over and experiencing the the, the same light and yeah it, i think for me this is a real indicative of the photographic fear of fear of missing out that you mm -hmm. can be in a location and have something amazing happen and at the same time <laughs> be missing something amazing over there but you can't you cannot be everywhere at once so I think sort of making peace with your own lot and I don't think it's easy but it's, it's sort of a human nature isn't it it's human nature to think well maybe if I got over that maybe if I'd gone and taken a photo over there instead of over there it'd be a better photo but of course art is subjective and moments are subjective but I felt like if I was going to include anybody else's photo in this talk, and um, of course, you know, a photo of, of these these amazing stones, and 
one taken on the same morning by someone whose work I absolutely admire it seems to be um, absolutely appropriate. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I think that fear of missing out thing is something a lot of people struggle with. And uh, yeah, you can beat yourself up with it, but really there's no point because it ain't going to change anything. You can only be in one place at a time. So um, quick comment from Adele, her, uh, her favourite place on Lewis. Thank you, Adele, for joining us as usual, which is fab. Um, I would imagine here, condition-wise, and we won't we won't um, spend too much longer on this, uh, V, just for time reasons, but I would imagine even with some dank, misty, kind of dark, black and whitey conditions, it would be a really cool place because of that historical background as well. So a really versatile location from the looks of it. Yeah, and uh, because uh, Lewis is so far north as well, if you get any kind of aurora going kicking off then especially in those winter months there's always the opportunity of uh, photographing the aurora either over the stones or over the coast as if you if you're sort of pointing north so yeah there's i've seen some cracking photos over the years of um the, the aurora over these stones which just adds to the the mystery and the mysticism of um the calendar stones themselves cool well thank you rich for letting us use that and <laughs> Verity will be aching to get back up there and get it past her own uh, filter, her own quality <laughs> filter, which is <laughs> too high sometimes. But this uh, image I really enjoy. And we, I, I, I think we used it for sort of a couple of the promo things earlier, a couple of weeks ago, or I used it last time. Um, because there's, there's a few things I really love about it, Verity. The, the, the tone palette, I think, is one of the main things. And these lovely um, graphical shapes down here with these rocks. And sometimes... Um, I would imagine a lot of us uh, can be guilty, you know, we, we get into this mindset of foreground, mid and background and we find just some rocks and we kind of think, oh yeah, well there's my foreground and it's a bit of a hole to fall into. It can't just be a rock or a set of rocks, there needs to be something going on <laughs> shape-wise. But tell us a little bit about A, the location, Boster, and also uh, let's dig into this image a little bit more as well. Uh, location is just it's a fantastic beach it's a fantastic area just for any kind of coastal photography because there's just so much going on and the one thing and I'll see, you'll see it in the next couple of images that that Lewis has in abundance is this metamorphic rock the nice rock of a silent G that I wear around my neck um so I've got plenty of, um, of of nice rock necklaces that I sort of take with me everywhere because I need a part of the island with me. And I think they just, they just, there's something about the tonality, the different layers to the rock and they're dotted all over the different beaches all over the island. They really add something to, to, to foreground of photos. I mean, they add something just to life, but you know, they're, they're really good to kind of um, hone in on those, all those different layers, all that different sort of sense of, you know, millennia and thousands millions of years of, of that i think um the the one of the oldest rocks found in the world if i'm not mistaken they yeah there's a real sense of history and it's a privilege to kind of to photograph them but this beach itself and this is what i mean when i say i really enjoy this part of the world when it's cloudy um there's no sun in this it's cloudy. It, it, I mean, I think I just got rained on. I think my dog was chasing, I don't know, a, a poor rabbit in the background. So that was trying to get her back under control. But there was this real lovely tonality to the water, the blues coming through. And I don't, squares are difficult to work in. Squares and compose it. I mean, I wouldn't have composed this as a square initially. And if I remember rightly, I composed it in portrait. And when I got it into into to Lightroom, realized that this is this is kind of where the composition is. Like it, it's almost tight. It's a tight composition. Mm. Um, and I'm using a wide angle lens to to a certain extent, but I'm sort of cropping that in because I want I don't want you to, to drift out of the the frame. I want you in that frame. I want you sort of going from the rock in the foreground to those turquoise blues and that kind of gray of the cloud behind and yeah so it just it just worked as a square which is rare <laughs> for me <laughs> yeah yeah I was gonna say I don't I haven't seen many 
images from you and it's interesting how different people just see in different ways and it's not that there is no right or wrong it's just i think some people just get more their, their eye just becomes more attuned to seeing uh mm. you know landscape portrait square whatever but i think you absolutely made the right choice for what it's worth from my end these big strong um angular lines down here really can work really nicely in squares and i think like you said keeping it contained um it, it, is really good what would what that extra sky above wouldn't really have helped us and any more rock below wouldn't really no. have helped us would it but i did want to pick up on the color you know i i know albeit i've had limited travel up in in some of these parts of the world but the color of the sea it can just be really really staggering and, and we can see a little bit of that here can't we that color is that do you think that's something that keeps drawing you back photographically and maybe mentally and spiritually yeah Definitely. I think it's look, at the first time you see it is a moment. And I think, uh, I, I guess I'm quite, <laughs> quite an emotional individual. So that kind of connection to uh, something, it's a visceral reaction to the, to the color of the sea. There's something just, and, and it's not just me, there, there are people who, yeah it's it's very easy to fall in love with this part of the world and i think this is the first time i went to the islands and i think mean, probably just standing on this shoreline was probably the first time i felt this is a place i want to keep coming back to this is a place that already if it's not too cliche to say has a little part of me um and those blues are absolutely included in that. And I'm a person who, um, I guess, early, early on in the, the in the photographic curve, as it were, was more drawn to warm tones. So shooting by the coast and being on the island just really taught me to fall in love with the cooler tones and how to how to make those work. And and, and as, as I was saying previously. It, it, you don't need light necessarily the absence of light becomes something that's that's really intriguing that's something that you can work with and that's why the island itself has so much potential it doesn't matter whether it's raining whether it's windy whether it's necessarily sunny all of that's going to really present opportunities for, for all kinds of different propositions mm. yeah and uh, yeah i would imagine time of day is kind of you're just going to get joy all day long especially in those winter when it's quite low light and and like you say no light but and i would imagine even just last word on this if you know had we had booming light punching in from one side and dark and colorful and you know it would be a completely different mood even though the composition could have stayed exactly the same so that awareness of cool tones being there and then how to deal with that afterwards as well is uh is i think something i would always encourage thinking about as you've said it can be a really nice way to deal with it um this maybe is more along the lines of what you were talking about there by using a, a vertical uh, composition and this is a really great example i think of uh using that in a really strong way to give give this sense of um you know this sort of sweeping foreground if you will which is, which is very hard to do in a square or in a or in a landscape image because mm -hmm. it just literally isn't the length um and I love the way you've left a whole load of space here because it just it accentuates that even more. And talk about finding a cool rock. I mean, I wouldn't hang <laughs> that around your neck. You probably wouldn't be going far for long. <laughs> uh, but, so t this is on the same beach, uh, obviously, presumably. Yes. Um, uh, so tell us, tell us the the story behind this one. Yeah, this is much more, I guess, a classic seascape type image a coastal image and i've included a couple in this talk because obviously you know that that's as as top billing it's the draw it's the coastal regions that will really ignite that just yeah that 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 real um love for the place and um, as we talk about metamorphic rock could you get any more of a cooler example than this rock and I think at the time I probably didn't even appreciate it that much. Um, I have a real thing about long exposures that aren't that long. Mm. Now, I love, yeah, I love the kind of misty seas that you can get from, you know, doing six, seven, eight minute long exposures. But for me, there's a real, 
real joy in capturing the sea moving in for a second or half a second when the tide's coming in or out. So you get that sense of movement, but it isn't overarching. It doesn't swallow up the whole image. It's more a, a nod to the fact that, yes, this is a still image, but it's capturing a moving moment, something that, you know, that ostensibly you shouldn't necessarily be able to capture in a still image. So, yeah, I think with this image in particular, it, what I wanted to do is just kind of use that rock and use the tide moving around it to pull people back into the mid-ground, into those turquoise colours that are happening beyond and the darker rain clouds behind. But yeah, I mean, I get stuck on the rock, if I'm honest. When I look at it again, I wish I could zoom in and just sort of look at every single detail on that rock in front, which is, again, you know, if I if I was doing this, this, this if I was capturing this image now, I, I may well sort of spend half an hour just doing macro photos of the, the different rusty tones and all of the stuff that's going on in, in that in that rock and all of the history it holds yeah it's um yeah uh, ditto <laughs> i'd like to spend an hour just fiddling around looking at it <laughs> but that's the thing on you sometimes you go to these beaches and you find a little spot like this and really you can spend a lot of time you know there isn't ever just one composition there isn't ever just one image um, there's always a myriad of ways of looking at it. And if you and I and whoever had been there, we would have all come back with something slightly different probably as well, uh, which is obviously part of the, part of the joy. Yeah. Um, I was just going to, yeah, I love that. Sorry. Sorry Verity. Ca- no, no, no. Carry on. If you were going to, I was just saying, you know, that's, that's what I kind of love about. It's, it's not static. Coastlines aren't static, you know, maybe the earlier image in, in, images in this sort of set, the landscape possibly hasn't changed that much, but you go to a, a, a the, the coastline and sand shifts and water moves and rocks are obscured and then revealed. And there, there's a real, um, it's time limited. And I really like that about, about coastal photography. It, it, you know, it's changing minute upon minute. And, and that can present you know, new opportunities as an afternoon wears on, for instance. Yeah, yeah. Um, and I think just as we move to the next image, um, we've got a few more left, everybody, um, to see us on for this evening. I think it was interesting the point you made about different exposure times. And, uh, you know, yes, there, there is a certain look which some people enjoy and do, do a great job with of, of maybe those super long exposures where, um, it's very much of that minimalist look, but I think you were referring to the fact that obviously when you are in some of these locations, it can feel quite dynamic. And so those shorter shutter speeds can maybe capture a little bit more of that dynamism into that, into, into the scene. This, this feels like a bit of a mix, but I would imagine that's quite a fast running foreground in front of us here, potentially. Um, but we, we've obviously got a slightly different view here in different locations. So maybe just fill us in on that first. Yeah, so like I said, there's just so many different bays and coastlines on Lewis that, that it, it, it's so worth exploring. This is one of them, this is Dalmore, and this is when the tide was coming in, so you're absolutely right. It was sort of an ever-changing um, scene where I'm sort of, you know, moving my tripod back and getting my feet wet, which happens continuously and is absolutely worth it. And I guess I've, I've popped this in because it's more of a traditional... Um, seascape where you know I'm using the foreground to lead you into the background and I've got some of that nice side sunset light coming in just illuminating the rocks as well just to add something else to it um and it's, it you know it's a long exposure I've probably done it, it's a bit longer than usual and it was a windy day so you're probably looking uh looking at sort of maybe four or five seconds and not, not too much just to add a little bit of movement in the cloud and in the foreground as well, maybe maybe a little longer, maybe more so like seven or eight seconds. Um, yeah, it's, and it's got a different feel to it because it's it's I guess it's less moody than the other images that have come before. It's got a sort of it's more yeah it's more of a classical beach type photography. But I think you know there's there's plenty of opportunity all over Lewis to kind of go and explore all of the different beaches and alcoves and caves and all of the, the 
I guess, you know, each one has something slightly different to offer, whether it's towering cliffs or whether it's majestic um, metamorphic rock in the foreground. And I think maybe that's what I really enjoy about the island. Yes, uh, different choices, different options, different availability. I think even as we mentioned there, you know, if you, if, you know, if you ever do, you're struggling or you lose your FOJO, as they call it, you know, my, <laughs> my, my advice is always, well, a, you know, there's a few things, but really, if you can get to some water, that's normally a pretty good thing to do. And even if you, you, you're struggling with a bigger thing, you know, like we talked about on the last one, you could get in on that little bit of rock there and you could, you could do something. I'm confident of that. But I, I think on this image, I love the light just touching the rock. It would feel pretty heavy otherwise if that wasn't kissed by that light. But that light mm. just gives relief, doesn't it, visually? Um, and it just sets the scene of that uh, lovely side light, which is something obviously a lot of us look for in our landscape work. Um, I'm going to just keep us honest, Verity, because of time reasons. We've got two images left and we've talked here about um you know i was just mentioning there about finding little details and i know that's something that you probably have done more and more of and i really enjoy this this image for lots of different reasons but i kind of want you to explain some of the background and also you probably got pretty grubby doing this is that fair to say <laughs> yeah in our in our family we call it the macro dive where <laughs> you just i'll be upright one minute and then on the floor the next and uh my other half will be like which oh you're, oh you're down there now great but you know this <laughs> the beach isn't just about the the big vistas it's about everything that's happening and there's so much potential to just divert your your eyes downwards when you're you know you, it, it's again sort of it's hard sometimes not to be consumed by wow look at this a miss what's what's in front of you and this is one of those moments when it was late morning the light had got really quite harsh so you know being a landscape photographer I was wondering if it was breakfast time um and sort of just wandering along the shoreline and seeing all of these majestic shells that have been deposited by the the outgoing tide and playing with the light and I think you know landscape photography just photography in general it's at its most uh wonderful it's at its most fulfilling when it's playful and you've got just the vague outline I'm down at 2.8 here I'm really uh, you know all I want really in focus is that shell I've got no real interest in getting anything else in focus all I want is to give a vague hint of the shoreline behind it and capture some of that 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 bokeh or bokeh depending on however you pronounce it that that's shining off of the off the sand glinting in the sun now this is with I forget it's just 7200 so I'm, i'm pulled back a bit um you could do the same with a macro lens depending on what you want from the image but i think there's so much to be found there's a simplicity to photography when you're on the, the on the beach yeah it doesn't I mean, it's just a lesson, isn't it? You know, you don't you don't have to go after those big views. There's plenty to be found. There's plenty to be photographing, rain or shine, bright sunshine and clear skies, or epic conditions. There's there's always something to be found that can pique your interest. Yeah, absolutely. Oh um, my! Uh, yeah, no, no. I think absolutely. And um, if you can be visually receptive or curious. Uh, to those things you, you can basically unleash a whole load of other shooting scenarios and, and basically you can shoot all day every day in any place anywhere um, and sometimes it'll work better than others that's how it goes isn't it Verity but <laughs> but it's the, the point the point is to be conscious of the fact that yeah if you're if you're thinking it isn't what you thought it was going to be on maybe the wider view then then this is a you know disrupt yourself go down do the dive do the verity dive as we're going to call it from now on. Uh, <laughs> or look up or trademark or, or, or change to a completely different lens or think in black and white or just you know what i mean you, you do have to shake yourself sometimes and just think have, have i really explored everything that could be here visually i suppose absolutely and i think creativity doesn't just it doesn't fit into you know a seven by five frame creativity can be anything it can and it you know to to 
to free yourself from the constraints of thinking I am here to photograph one thing and one thing only I think is maybe the, the biggest lesson we can learn as as photographers and creatives and not to get too deep and philosophical but you know it's nearly nine o'clock and you know this is my philosophical hour um as humans as well you know we can change our perception yeah definitely um cool okay well last image and then i've got a little bit of housekeeping just at the end and i really wanted to put this last because i think this is super cool and very sort of um you know, there's a lot of things going on here to do with how we view images um this this idea of the sort of the single sometimes it's the single tree sometimes it's the single person sometimes it's the single house something that feels like it's enveloped by its surroundings for, for whatever reason i think intrigues a lot of us as photographers and as as viewers as well and when you complement that with this lovely snaking road and the light around it and i'm sorry very i'm stealing all the stuff about it no but, steal steal away <laughs> but it but it you know it really feels quite evocative and i don't know you know why uh why is it you think and it's a difficult question why do you think we have this fascination sometimes with the with the lone subject you know what what is it that we're trying to connect with or portray with that the tough one for 856 isn't it sorry Verity. <laughs> oh it's nice I, I love your your wild card questions uh, you know they, these are the ones these are the, these are the food for thought the soul food I, I think it's to do with simplicity I think it's to do with a recognition of something that, that simplifies something that could otherwise be quite complicated for us to take in it gives us a focal point it gives us something to concentrate on and that helps us make sense of the rest of the image um and yeah i mean the road running through this would help give us some of that focal point but i think the house on its own just <laughs> that's the thing that sort of sets it off and the light the light um creeping across again this almost icelandic yeah you can see how they were connected at some point in the in the, in the distant past that icelandic type um a volcanic-esque almost landscape um yeah it, it's 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 interesting, isn't it? And, and I think it's to do with how we read images as well, you know, that the idea of reading an image from, from one side to the other, and I guess because of the line that leads you from the, the left-hand part of the image all the way through to the right-hand part of the image. And it's one of those images, again, like it, my, my wife really likes it. She, I think she has it as a phone, either her MacBook background or her phone background. She really enjoys it. And it's one of those where I'm like, okay i'm not sure why you enjoy that more than any of the other images but yeah i think uh, maybe sometimes the mystery of why people like and love certain perspectives versus other perspectives i think is part of the the majesty of being in this um continuum of 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 landscape photography well deep question deep answer um i think <laughs> If anyone at home, if you have any doubts about the importance of that house, hold your thumb up just over your screen and cover the house. And you'll, you'll soon find that that little thing occupying 5% of the frame is actually making 95% of the, of the importance. And actually really what's doing it for me, uh, this is all subjective, is that reflection off the top, that reflection, that light just catching on the roof um, is, is just doing everything. And like, like, like Verity says, we all view images differently we all bring our own baggage some people might think that's a beautifully romantic place to stay i would imagine some people would be horrified to stay there because it would feel very remote <laughs> uh, which camp are you in verity oh sign me up to that house for the there next six months that'd be great thanks <laughs> exactly ditto me too um and i wonder whether you know the, the warmth and the colors and the light you know maybe add to that had we had this in a hellishly cold or cool sort of look maybe that that brings its own thing as well and that's some of the things we've talked about isn't that color palette can be very reflective of mood and suggestive mm -hmm. of mood perhaps as well um absolutely uh i'm amazingly i'm kept us on time it's the first time for everything uh david says he absolutely loves this image and uh, lynn there's a sense of mystery in the image there is isn't there you can you know who knows where we're going and where that is and and 
what could be going on there probably just some whiskey drinking that seems to be what goes on everywhere from people telling me from that part of the world um yeah. with that sweeping generalization aside um i'm gonna i'm gonna say thank you very much verity it's always a pleasure never a chore i like to drag you deep on some philosophical things and i because i know you enjoy i love it, it. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you'll notice I didn't ask what settings. Or you got the wrong guy if you want to know that kind of thing, I'm afraid. But we will yeah. always take questions if you, if you have them. Um, next week, uh, I'm going to be back with Mr. Super B. Adrian Beasley and myself are going to be doing our creative choices. So listen, we have some images from the last session that we didn't get to, but we would like some more of your raw files to give us uh, even more choice. So I will pop a uh, link in this comments of the, th the thread of this stream. Crikey, it's been a long one. I'm sorry. And I've had no gin or alcohol or anything. Um, <laughs> and uh, the Facebook uh, uh, will be posting the link again in Facebook in the following days and on the Light and Land newsletter, which I'm hoping you should all be signed up to because there's lots of I information that comes out on that every week as well. Uh, Verity, I made it. Uh, you've made it too. We've we've sort of worked to combine eight, eighty-seven we hours today between us. <laughs> <laughs> um, but thank you very much. I really enjoy doing stuff with you, and you, I'm sure we'll have you back on in the future. Uh, thank, thank you for you. having me again. You're very welcome. You're very welcome. Uh, and thank you everyone for the comments. Do us, do me a big favor. Hit like on the post, and if you really like what we do, hit share on the post as well. It just helps us get the word out there. But for now, that is it from us. I shall see you next week with Adrian Beasley. Uh, thank you very much for watching. Cheerio for now. <laughs>